Hello, uh, greetings, and thank you for attending this month's science seminar presented by NSF's National Ecological Observatory Network, operated by Battelle. Our goal with this monthly series of talks is to build community among researchers at the intersection of ecology, environmental science, and NEON. We're excited to have a team from Pacific Northwest National Laboratory and the University of Kansas here to present today. Before we turn it over to the speakers, just a few logistics. Uh, we've enabled optional automation for today's talk. If you'd like to use it, find the CC button in your menu bar. The webinar consists of a presentation followed by Q&A. As you think of questions, please add them to the Q&A box. We also have a meeting chat that you can use to share links and other items of interest but add speaker questions to the Q&A and we'll facilitate discussion at the end. Um, there also should be an opportunity to ask questions over audio. Um, NEON contributes everyone who shares our values of unity, creativity, collaboration, excellence, and appreciation as outlined in our NEON code of conduct. This applies to NEON staff as well as anyone participating in a NEON event. The full code of conduct is available via a link that I'll share in the chat in just a moment and also be found at the bottom of the science seminar webpage. The talk will be recorded and made available for later viewing on the NEON science seminar webpage. And lastly, if you have any ideas for a talk for this seminar series, nominate yourself or a colleague today by filling in the form on our science seminar webpage. Now I'll turn it over to Zach to introduce today's speakers. Thanks, Bobby. Uh, James, you can go ahead and get your screen shared and I'll, I'll give the introduction. So thanks everybody for coming. We're excited to kick this round off, uh, kick this round of seminars off with uh, speakers today, Amy Goldman, Vanessa Garayaburu Caruso, Brianne Forbes, and James Stegan, all from the Pacific Northwest National Lab, and Bree Waterman from the University of Kansas. So this group comes to us from a mixture of disciplines and career stages. And today they're gonna to be speaking about advancing ecological sciences via participatory science through a river-focused use case based out of the Worldwide Hydro Biogeochemistry Observation Network for dynamic river systems or wonders. So um, the team we have with us, go ahead and take it away whenever you're ready. All righty. Thank you so much for having us here today. Um, I'm Amy Goldman. And in addition to the folks that will be speaking, we have a few other team members in attendance and I wanna thank them as well as our broader team and many, many collaborators across the world. Before we dig into these use case details, I'm going to introduce a few topics so that we're all starting from a common foundation. So the Worldwide Hydrobiogeochemistry Observation Network for Dynamic River Systems, or WONDERS, was founded in 2017. And WONDERS is a global consortium studying river corridors. One goal of WONDERS is to accelerate river corridor science by developing data, knowledge, and models that are transferable across river corridors. This is key to enhancing predictive capacity from regional to continental to global scales. Another goal is to work with folks outside of our immediate science team and to find opportunities for mutual benefit. We often ask what data or connections or information are people interested in? How can we work together to achieve those interests while investigating a particular science question? This set of goals aligns with the ICON science principles, which we use as the foundation of WONDERS decisions. ICON is simply an acronym for this set of principles, integrated, coordinated, open, and networked. And I'll define those in more in just a moment. These principles act as a framework for people or projects that are motivated by these two goals I mentioned, mutual benefit with people beyond our immediate team and transferable knowledge beyond a single study site or focal area. This set of principles just helps guide you to reach those goals. 
So ICON principles guides wonders to intentionally design work that is integrated, coordinated, open, and networked. And what does that mean in this context? Integrated across physical, chemical, biological, and their social attributes and scales to encourage diverse insights. Coordinated with other projects to use consistent protocols and methods to enable transferability and synthesis open and fair throughout the research life cycle to promote knowledge exchange and engagement, networked whereby research is designed and or implemented with a broad range of interested parties to facilitate mutual benefit. And the use cases will dig into how these principles come to life across Wonders activities. If you're interested in learning more about ICON, I suggest you check out the ICON Science Cooperative, which is developing resources to help projects apply ICON in their work. So Wonders operationalizes these ICON principles to achieve its science goals through participatory science. As a very brief overview, this includes designing studies in an open collaborative way, sending out free sampling kits to global volunteers, generating data in a centralized space for consistency, and then publishing the data openly and creating opportunities for people to learn how to work with the data. This approach has been really exciting. Wonders has worked with collaborators to collect samples from hundreds of locations globally with a specific focus on the continental United States through a series of studies since 2018. And this has resulted in numerous published public data sets and included high resolution organic matter characterization as one of those data types. Wonders has also facilitated several open collaborative analysis and writing opportunities, which have developed both scientific innovation and also new relationships for folks. Bree Waterman, who is presenting with us today, is someone we met through one of these collaborative open opportunities, which is really exciting. And there are a multitude of outcomes from doing participatory science, particularly in this icon principle guided way. So now that we've built out some common language, you're gonna hear from James about the motivation for two wonder studies, the summer 2019 sampling and the Icon Modex AI guided study. Okay, excellent. Thanks Amy for getting us going. As Amy mentioned, I'm just gonna give a little bit of high level uh, context for why are we interested in studying river systems at all? and as mentioned, there'll be a few use cases. We'll kind of dig into some into the detailed science. So to begin with, um, you can think about terrestrial landscapes are really fundamentally organized into watersheds. And the associated stream networks that you can see visualized here, those are sometimes are thought of as like the veins of the earth in the sense that streams and rivers connect what's going on in upland hill slope terrestrial systems to the ocean they transport material they transform material during those flow uh, uh, during that transport influencing nutrient cycling carbon cycling water quality habitat um, and really a core part of the of the earth system and historically these kinds of systems these stream networks river networks were thought of as passive pipes and they are modeled as such in like large earth system models that uh, with the aim of predicting earth's future future climate future environment these kinds of systems were treated as passive pipes um, and there's this famous paper in 2007 cole et al that addressed this and really uh, pretty soundly rejected this concept or the or the neutral pipe hypothesis. As they state here, it's that hypothesis is untenable, and freshwater ecosystems are an active component of the global carbon cycle that deserve attention. And so we take some inspiration from that, that these are critical systems that really need attention. They need mechanistic, need to understand them mechanistically to be able to anticipate their future and their future impacts on the earth system. And a similar kind of perspective is was uh, presented last year, but all at all in nature, I just love that really like this, this quote that river networks are the largest biogeochemical nexus on the planet among continents, ocean, and the atmosphere. Again, kind of emphasizing the really critical role that stream networks, river networks play in the global system, earth system. And so within that context, there are you know, these, these important um, an important part of the earth system of course they occupy a very small part of, of the earth system the earth's terrestrial landscape 
And so we can start to think about what components within these systems do we really need to understand mechanistically? And I'm going to emphasize um, sediment respiration on the next slide. And you'll see this show up in our case studies uh, along the way. Um, so in this case, just thinking through, if you think about a stream, you walk up to a stream, you see flowing water, right? That's like the thing we usually relate or associate with a stream. That's the surface water, the water column. That water's flowing over sediments. There's algae, there's organisms in there, a lot of microbes. There's a lot of biogeochemistry going on within those sediments. And it's often the major biogeochemical reactor, if you will, within river networks that then influence a broader earth system, as I was saying. So we think about this as, we sometimes call this ER sed or ecosystem respiration related to, to sediments. It can be an important ecosystem control point in the language from Bernhard et al. Uh, several years ago, kind of like a biogeochemical hotspot, if you like that language. But it's really interesting. It's not always. And so let's go through these four bullet points. Like, why do we think about ER sed and sediment, sediment respiration? Well, it can contribute up to 100% of respiration of metabolism is going on within a stream, a given any given stream reach. And you can see this on the right-hand side. This is some of the work from our a project we lead out of PNNL. And this is the Yakima River Basin. This is in the Northwest uh, of the US. And it's 16,000 square kilometers, just for kind of scale reference. And all those dots on there are places where we went and we measured stream metabolism, how much carbon dioxide basically, or how much organic carbon is being processed in the stream, in the water column and in the sediments collectively. And then we did some additional measurements that allowed us to parse out what's going on specifically in the sediments. And what we find basically the big purple dots on the map are places where sediments dominate. They're basically contributing to all the respiration going on. So that's the first bullet. Sediment respiration is important. But very interestingly, it's not always important. You can see some yellow dots in there as well. Those are places where the water column, when you walk up there and you see the flowing water, reactions going on in the water column are actually the major driver of the system. In those cases, what's happening in sediments don't matter so much. So both are important and that varies. The fractional, the relative influence varies. But there's no model yet that can really account for that or predict that, and in part, that's because there's lots of data sets on in situ stream respiration for the whole system, the whole stream, uh, but not a lot of data sets, not a lot of study parsing between the water column and the sediments. Um, and so in addition, you think about these large scale perspectives on the importance of stream networks, river networks to the global carbon cycle, let's say, those are often done through mass balance approaches. They're not necessarily done from the bottom up from a mechanistic perspective. And so the relevance of these systems, the uncertainty that, that exists, and the need for bottom up mechanistic understanding often motivates us to pursue research efforts in the context of wonders. And so from here, Vanessa is going to take over and tell you about one of those studies that we did in 2019. Vanessa? Thank you, James. So as you saw from Amy's slides, we have had lots of studies, particularly the one in 2019 had a strong focus on sediment respiration uh, within the continental US. And so some of our motivations were how do organic matter chemistry and microbial communities explain that variation in sediment respiration? We also sample uh, places globally and uh, we could ask more questions related to what kinds of organic organic matter are common across multiple rivers in the globe, either in the water or in the sediments? And is there any specific thing that explains these changes in metabolomes? So the way that we achieved this study with WONDERS is that we decided to focus on sampling of surface water and shallow riverbed sediments during August of 2019. So for this, we uh, sent free materials and protocols across uh, all of our collaborators to make sure that all of our samples and data was interoperable. We also engaged with a lot of existing networks, some of the LTERs, NEON, and other collaborators to collect samples. Once we 
uh, engage with them. We also hosted several different seminars and community calls where we uh, share with them what were our questions or motivations and our plan and ask for feedback, feedback on our protocols and our metadata collection. And through this process, we also learned that other sample types would be very valuable to the community. So we had several collaborators request additional aliquots that we could collect through this sampling so they could uh, advance their own science. And, and so at the end, we ended up collecting uh, 98 uh, samples on 98 sites across eight different countries. We collected over 31 data types, which translated to over 7,000 subsamples. And the greatest thing of this is that all of our data is publicly available and accessible and free for the community to use. With this uh, type of efforts, we we had uh, not only surface water and riverbed sediments, but we had sediment respirations for all of the continental U.S. sites. You can see here in the map uh, all of the sites that we collected sample from, and the red dots are particularly uh, sites that were where samples were collected via NEON collaboration. So we're very thankful to all of our collaborations with NEOM, ENSOL, and JGI to produce also our organic matter chemistry data and our microbiology and ESSDI for hosting all of our uh, data uh, open to the community. So with this, we can have an impact. We can employ the power of large, diverse teams to discover via open collaborative manuscripts. So we, we decided to host a participatory manuscript campaign where we started with a workshop and we engaged with the community uh, either people who collected samples or just anyone who wanted to participate. And we brought to them an idea to the table, some of those ideas that we had as a motivation of this study. And what we quickly learned is that the data is so rich that with just one idea for this participatory manuscript, we ended up with six groups that created totally different science questions from the same data set, the Wonders is 19S campaign. And so if you wanna see what is already published in our special issue of Frontiers in Waters, you're welcome to scan the QR code. We can also post a link in the chat. And, and so out of this, we can just see that with one data set, we can have so much scientific impact. And now Bree is gonna tell you a little more about other questions that we have been able to ask with this data. Yeah, thank you, Vanessa. Um, so yeah, kind of uh, back to what James was talking about with respiration and how it's such an important um, biogeochemical process. With all of this data, kind of one of the first questions that came about was, can we actually predict those respiration rates? Um, so with the data that was sent in from the collaborators, um, the sediments were put into these bioreactors, which you can see here uh, with this little vial. and dissolved oxygen concentrations were monitored over time. You can see that on that graph um, on the right. And the uh, slope of the line that connects those time points is the change in concentration over time, which is the respiration rate. So we had respiration rates from, again, across CONUS, across all these different environments, and we had a bunch of other um, complementary data, and we wanted to see, can we predict um, respiration? And so back to the six uh, S nineteen S um, sampling effort. This figures from Gary et al. twenty twenty four, which uh, was kind of one of the first papers to come out of this data. Um, you can see the red dots on this map are showing uh, that specific S nineteen S the summer nineteen two thousand nineteen sampling uh, camp sampling um, effort, and then uh, these pink dots are from that more local. Uh, study that again James was mentioning earlier because it had similar uh, similar measurements that were taken. So all of that was combined kind of in this first initial effort to kind of address this question of can we predict uh, respiration rates? And then this was also included uh, also included with this was data from open uh, open repositories from hydro sheds and glow rich, which give you information on the watershed characteristics, the river characteristics, and other um, chemistry data for those sites. So we coupled that with um, the data that was sent in. And so this is kind of just a walkthrough of that initial model that was built off of that data. Um, so it's 
um, I'll briefly walk through this, but if you're interested, again, it's that Gary et al. 2024 paper, uh, the QR code, and I'm sure a link will be added. But so with all of those input features, the, the open source data of the watersheds, the uh, respiration, uh, the data that's coupled with the respiration, so the water chemistry, the sediment chemistry, all of that is input into this ensemble of ensembles machine learning framework. And what that is, is essentially um, kind of what it sounds like. It's just a bunch of machine learning models that are um, packaged together. So if we look at this first green box, this is called a super learner, and there's 10 instances of this. And within each of those instances, there are 15 sub machine learning models. And so basically, this approach um, removes any bias of any particular machine learning approach and um, allows kind of the data to, to speak for itself. So when you ensemble the data, um, all of that is stacked on top of each other and the final prediction rate that's output um, is weighted by how well those models perform. And again, if you'd like more information, please see the paper, <laughs> but yeah. Um, and from that first, um, that first attempt, that first uh, study that was done, the model was not super great. Um, we, so this plot here is just showing the predicted versus uh, the predicted on the y-axis versus the observed rates um, from those bioreactors on the uh, x-axis. And we can see that there, there's a trend, but the trend falls off of that one-to-one -one line. Um, and when we look at the distributions, the model tended to kind of push everything towards this central, this average value. Whereas in reality, we actually see quite a quite a lot of cold spots or regions where, or sediment with lower respiration than we do high respiration. But regardless, we were able to build, they were able to build this machine learning framework and they were able to start to understand kind of mechanistically what's important. And this organic matter chemistry was one of those really important drivers. And so this, again, is just showing that. So on the x-axis is a metric for how important each variable is for um, explaining what you're trying to predict, which is, for our case, the respiration, the sediment respiration. And so kind of some major uh, findings from that initial effort were that the river gradient and the land cover of the upstream uh, watershed are important for explaining the respiration. What really sticks out is this water chemistry or this organic matter chemistry. So specifically nominal oxidation state and carbohydrate like carbohydrate like diversity. And so with all of this effort, um we they were able to see that okay, we're getting we're getting a mechanistic understanding, but we need more data to be able to um have these models behave the way that we need to uh accurately predict respiration. And so Bree is going to take you through the next effort that was uh, carried out to, to get more data. Great, thank you. Yeah, so to start off this new effort to gain all this new knowledge and more data, um, we after once we had the initial study concept, we had two community calls where we again asked for feedback so that the community could help shape the study and identify opportunities for mutual benefit. Um, and so to do this, we use an online platform called Poll Everywhere. Uh, in this first call, we posed a number of questions to the attendees so they could upvote or downvote responses that were either pre-populated or attendees wrote in in real time during this meeting. Um, after we received this feedback, we then made changes to our study design and had a second call to present these changes and then again receive more feedback um, on the study design and um, so some of these changes resulted in uh, adding temporal sampling. So we utilized three neon sites for this temporal sampling. We also uh, added in some additional surface water chemistry and sediment biomass data types to the design study. So the underlying approach of this study is what we call model experiment iteration or MODEX. Um, so we used the data from the S19S study that you heard Brie talk about as the initial input to the machine learning model, along with the available geospatial data that Brie touched on with River Atlas and um, those open access data sources. So while we found the 
microbial data and the organic matter to have a lot of importance, those are uh, often difficult to scale up. And so we wanted to set out to see if we can improve the models with simple data, such as this dissolved oxygen respiration rates and these geospatial variables, but using this iterative MODEX method. Um, once we built the first iteration of the machine learning model, it then guided new sampling locations based on model uncertainty and environmental divergence. So this is why we wanted to see if we could improve the model by asking the model, where should we go collect samples? So we then widely advertised this opportunity for community members to sample at these AI guided sites and set sampling kits out to these volunteers. Um, and the data collected was then added to the model input, the models were rebuilt, and we were given new guidance for sampling locations. And we repeated this cycle each month for a total of 18 times. So this animation cycles through some of these months of AI guidance on sampling sites. Note that the month in the lower left is showing you these monthly iterations. Um, so we aren't getting into the detail of the two different map markers, but they represent two different types of priority sampling locations that was informed by these AI models. Um, and this graphic shows the spatial shift in sites with each monthly iteration. And in the beginning, we see dramatic changes in the spatial di distribution. But as time went on and we collected more samples and there was more input data, we saw a stabilization in the regions of priority. By the end of the study, we had 142 collaborators generate over 100, sorry, 1,700 samples over these 18 months and across most of the contiguous United States. Um, part of this includes the three neon sites, which you can see um, those square points on this map, um, which were visited every other month at, for a total of six times at each site. Um, and together, the ICON and MODEX frameworks shaped this robot robust data set that ultimately resulted in an increased model performance, which we will now describe more of. Yes, and so now applying that same model framework that I talked about from those first uh, S19S uh, samples, this is now with all of the data from that second effort or continued, the 18 months of effort of continuous sampling, sampling across CONUS. Um, and so there's kind of two different colors on here. There's a this red line, which is showing you kind of that initial, kind of what we, they saw in real time. Um, so as they got the data in, they uh, guided the models and there was an improvement in the model score um, or model performance as samples came in and they were guided by these this AI framework. Um, and then this blue line is, or these blue bars are just showing you kind of in hindsight, um, the modeling process. So um, this big jump uh, you can see was from uh, taking the data and uh, transforming it with the log 10 transformation. And we can see that that substantially increased model performance, but either way, um, even just as we increased uh, sample sites, um, the model performed. And so we have um, a pretty well-performing model. And again, back to these, um, these predicted versus ob observation observed rates. Um, this one on the left is showing you what I showed you earlier from that first S19S um, model effort. And then this is kind of where we've landed now. So with this improved model uh, framework, this MODEX framework, um, the model has increased, um, especially for high uh, hotspots or locations or sediments with high respiration. And there's still sort of this divergence at low spots or at cold spots. Um, so the model is still kind of biasing towards the average and not capturing these, these low rates of respiration. And just spatially, um, this map on the left is showing what this looked like at the CONUS scale from that first model. And we can see that there's these hot spots that show up that are, again, still consistent with what we see in the final rates on the right map. Yeah. Um, and another thing to point out um, is with this, this final iteration, um, the model was better at capturing these low spots. So you can see um, there's kind of more of these slow, which is the blue color um, across CONUS, and then these persistent hot spots. 
And this one is kind of a lot, so I'm just going to highlight what's important. But this is, again, just the feature permutation index. So the higher that value is on the x-axis, the more important that variable is for explaining the predict or for explaining uh, the uh, respiration value. And so on the y-axis, it's just all of the variables that were input into that model. And so consistent with what we saw with the first modeling effort, river and catchment variables, which I think they're animated. If, yeah, so um, those are the two that are kind of sticking out, which is consistent with that first effort. So the stream gradient, how fast the stream water is flowing, um, and the slope um, the gradient. Um, and then also there's catchment variables, which um, also will pop up. Yeah, so climate and the land use. Uh, so we see this consistent result between this first effort and this second effort. Um, but we saw with those predicted versus observation plots that there's still some work to be done. And um, what has been input so far into the model is just these basic geospatial attributes and some basic chemistry um, and none of the like high, uh, more detailed organic matter chemistry um, that has yet to be processed and is in, or in being processed at the moment. So eventually uh, we want to Put that into the model and um as we can as we saw in that first effort we saw that those that's what's more that's what's most important for explaining respiration so we're hoping to improve um the models with including this data and this last map is just showing um the the error so it's the error across the u.s um, the red spots are again showing you where that error was high, which is kind of where the model, the Modex framework prioritized uh, where to sample. And we saw that in this final map on the right that we were able to minimize those red spots, um, but can, including this high quality organic matter data, can we improve it even more? And so that's kind of the future directions. Great. Thank you, Bree. Um, and thank you all for listening. As we wrap up, I want to call out some opportunities to engage with wonders. We've done a number of virtual classroom presentations to interested folks. We are also happy to partner with faculty on proposals. We're happy to work with students to help them use data and models to write papers, to pursue internships, and to expand their own network of collaborators. And we can, in general, engage with any researchers in collaboration and training, and anyone at all can get involved in collecting samples and data, participating in this Modex loop work, and also influencing and informing wonders studies. So if you're interested in any of these, please email us. I'll drop that into the chat as well. Um, and now we are happy to answer questions. Thank you. Thank you all. That was a very interesting, great talk and really good passing back and forth between five people that went very smoothly. So that's awesome. Um, yeah, so we're open to questions. You can put a question into the Q&A. You can request to be unmuted and show your video to ask an audio question. Um, so yeah, we'll, let me check the Q&A right now. I don't see any yet, so I can start with one. Um, sure. So something that NEON works really hard to do is to standardize all of our data collection across sites so that, so that the results are comparable. And I imagine that's even more of a challenge for you. Um, or was it a case where you just have so many samples coming in that if some of them are, are outliers, it doesn't affect the model too much? Is there like training that you do for for people who participate or? Yeah, I can start off and then uh, someone can take it over either James or Vanessa, maybe um, in terms of the, the sort of logistical component, um, the sampling kits that we send out, the reason we send out sampling kits instead of having people use their own supplies is so that everyone is using the same supplies. 
we write really detailed protocols. Some people might say too detailed, <laughs> really detailed protocols so that everyone is really following the same set of instructions. We also make video protocols to help folks so that there's like that extra information, the visual component as well. So we're really doing everything we can to sort of set people up for success in that way. And then we're doing the actual analyses and data generation over at PNNL and EMSL for the most part um, so that it's all being actually generated in one place. And I don't know if James or Vanessa want to talk a little bit more about that component. Um, I, I mean, I think what Amy said uh, basically covers all of it. Another thing that I would like to add is that, you know, we know that sometimes field work is not always linear. So we are always there on call in case there is a, a need to to ask, uh, just, you know, this happened, what do I do? And, and, you know, we've had some people that had to change sampling dates just because there was a freeze event that no one calculated and things like that. So, you know, even though there's like all of these, we, we are always in contact with the people to make sure that we we are able to to take care of things that happen and, and no one can can quantify it up front. So, and then, you know, like Amy said, we generate all the data. We do a lot of QAQC and we release the data as soon as it's QAQC and then the public is able to use it. And we're happy to be as involved or as handoff as people want when it comes to data analysis and use of the data. We're always there to answer questions and meet with people as well. Great, thank you very much. Uh, we have a question from Kate in the chat asking, can you describe your process for garnering participants and then vetting the quality of sample collection? I can start off again on that. Um, so we, we try to do really a lot of different things and we're always kind of looking for new ideas. The idea is to sort of spread the information as widely as possible. So that takes many digital forms, it's social media, it's announcing at conferences, it's emails, listserv, message boards, um, all those types of things. Also direct emails to people, people we know, also cold emails. Um, and that can be if we're looking at specific institutions that we're trying to reach out to or specific people we're trying to reach out to or specific areas that we're trying to reach out to. There's really a pretty wide array um and yeah we're always looking for for other new ways as well um in terms of the quality of sample collection i would say that for the most part we we haven't had tremendous issues with that um I'd say the biggest component of that likely comes in the realm of filtering water um but we're looking at everything that comes into the lab pretty closely and I don't know, Vanessa, if you want to speak to that, or Brie, if you want to speak more to the garnering participants. To add to the sample quality, we also created a, another video protocol to reduce contamination to ensure participants are aware of different pieces to look at. Make sure you're wearing gloves, don't touch these areas of the vials and that kind of thing. Um, but I think you hit on the, all the points of the uh, participation. Particularly with your second round where you had AI generated um, geography of where where you needed to sample, was that a lot of cold emailing and like reaching out to universities that were in that area or researchers you knew or even didn't know? Yeah, there was definitely a decent amount of cold emailing towards the end. Um, and we, yeah, we started reaching out to, we re reach out to people, we followed up. Uh, there was a very regimented schedule of ensuring we were getting responses without, without being too pushy. Um, and yeah. we contacted a lot of people. Yeah. 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 I can imagine that would be a lot of, a lot of emails. Uh, let's see here. We have a question. We have a science question. Um, oh, sure. In, in the early figure, um, you showed very low percent of respiration contributed by sediment in a couple of the locations within the watershed. And they're asking, was that because the absolute sediment respiration was lower or it was, was it just that the total respiration was higher? 
I think that's referring to the figure that James showed at the beginning. Yeah, <clears throat> let me go back to that. And uh, Vanessa and or Bree may also want to comment. So, okay, maybe I'll reshare my screen. It's a little bit different setup at the moment, but it's probably okay. All right, so, oh, no, it's not shared yet. Oh my, I'm having trouble. Okay, so hopefully you can see that well enough. Um, okay, so these yellow dots, I think is what people, what the question is about. And so the the color is the fractional contribution. So yellow is like low fraction from sediments. The size of the circle is the the sediment rate itself. So a small circle, meaning a slow rate. And we try to avoid like high and low because they're negative numbers. So we'll just say slow and fast. So a small circle is slow. And so you got a couple of these, like the, the smallest contribution, the smallest fraction, there's this kind of a small circle. Oh my God, I'm having a hard time. And kind of a medium size. Um, and so I would say it varies. In some cases, sediment respiration is just super slow, thus leading to a low contribution. In other cases, like in the, in the lower right there, sediment respiration is actually fairly fast, but nonetheless, it's a fairly small fraction because likely in that location, um, that's on the main stem of a seventh order river, and it's kind of deep and slow in that location. So you have a lot of water volume that can contribute a lot of, of reaction, basically, and, and overall respiration to the whole system. So a lot of lots going on in the sediments, but not as much as what's going on in the water, because there's so much water and it's slow and kind of turbid in that location. It's a lot of reactive surface as well. Is that answering the question that was asked? I, I think so. Okay. I'll stop sharing again. We have uh, a question about the community polling process from Sarah. So she asked, I'm curious to hear more about the community poll process they used. How did they advertise these polls? How many people responded? How did they assess the expertise of those responding? I can start this off again. Um, so the polls occurred during those community calls that we had. So they weren't polls that we put out for separate answering asynchronously. Um, and the advertising is much like what I described before. We sort of try to advertise those calls as widely as possible as well. Um, they're really open for anyone to join. And um, I think in terms of attendees to those calls, I want to say, I don't know, James, if you recall for the Icon Modex ones, I think we had in the realm of 70 or so people at each one. Bree, maybe you remember. Um, and in terms of the expertise of those responding, um, I don't know, James, if you want to speak to that. Sure. So the people that, that were joining, um, I mean, some of them we know just because like our collegial professional networks. Um, but many people we didn't, uh, which was really cool. And we didn't do any formal vetting, if, if you want to use that word of like, oh, is this person know what they're talking about or not? What we did is is we, we did the polling like was discussed um, and we listened and we were looking for the priority um, ideas suggestions, comments, requests that rose to the top. So that's a really nice thing about that poll everywhere um, platform is you start to get consensus in real time. You don't wait for it later. People are upvoting and downvoting and they can see what's going on. And so let's just do the thought experiment of like, maybe there's a couple people that aren't experts and have some, a couple thoughts. They may have a great idea. Right. A lot of times great ideas come from places you may not expect initially. And if those ideas kind of catch on, cool. The experts will start like, oh, that's a great idea. Let's upvote that. Um, and so it was it was done in that 
spirit of consensus. And then there's another step where we're listening. We have to make choices at the end of the day to make sure these studies we're doing align with the science we're supposed to be doing, that we're funded to do, and finding mutual benefit. And so we have to filter a little bit to make sure that we're keeping on track for what our sponsor wants and while trying to meet community needs. And so we're not taking every suggestion literally and just implementing it regardless. Like we have to kind of select and do the best we can. Um, and so through that process, um, I guess because of that process, we don't feel a strong need to do vetting per se and like listen more to quote unquote experts or less to other people. Just keep it open and kind of see what goes on and then use our own thinking and needs, et cetera, to kind of make final decisions at the end of the day. Is that helping to answer that one? Yeah, thanks. Um, a quick follow-up. Did you in that in that moment during that time, were there any things that surprised you guys as the team of, of the core team or the PIs that maybe was suggested by the community that you were surprised at or hadn't initially thought of that ended up being a benefit? I will throw one in and and see if other people have have some some more. Uh, honestly, one of the things that surprised me, uh, and this was let me see, this was for the S nineteen S in particular. Um, there were several folks that were very excited to use their own resources to analyze samples to generate data back for the community um, to kind of add on, and so. It was so cool. It was like they saw the vision, they got engaged, and they're like, oh, you know what? Um, so that very, one very tangible example that ended up generating data on hundreds of samples that must have cost them a lot of time and money, and the data are open and on ESS Dive uh, was a group in Israel, actually, um, that wanted to generate data on uh, microbial cell counts. And they have expertise in doing flow cytometry. And so we sent them, I don't actually remember the exact number, but several hundred samples of water and sediments that they ran through their flow cytometry uh, workflow and sent the data back. And we're just like, yeah, um, there's the data. Give it to the community. Awesome. So that just like, anyway, humans are great, right? Like, people leaning in and wanting to contribute to something was surprising in some sense and super encouraging as well. And maybe Amy or others have other elements they want to drop in. Well, we'll uh, ask another question. Great answers though. Thank you, James. Um, from Kaylin, uh, she said these are really cool model outputs. Are there plans to incorporate these model outputs for water and or soil into some of the larger global models to replace the quote unquote pipe in those models? Vanessa, do you want to, you want to take a first step at that? You don't have to. I think uh, you can go first. Okay. Okay. So um, that is a long-term vision. Absolutely. Um, how we get there, I'm not going to say super clear quite yet, but absolutely that that's the hope. Um, and this is one of the reasons Amy was talking at the beginning about ICON as a framework and principles. There was two reasons to do icon one is mutual benefit we've been talking a lot about that the other is transferability and and amy spoke to this a bit of like having knowledge data types etc that are beyond case studies that, ex that apply and have relevance across diverse settings one of the reasons we're motivated to go in that direction is exactly towards this question that's being asked how do you inform an earth system model 
that has to simulate stream networks across the planet. You need knowledge that's transferable that applies across all those diverse settings. Um, and so that's one reason we try to do work at such large scales to pull out generalities that can be useful for large scale models. Because at the end of the day, those large scale models need very simple algorithms and mathematical representations of processes. And to me, at least, I come from a background of macroecology. Um, I view that as like, how do you get there? You get there through viewing the metaphorical forest, characterizing it, understanding it. Um, and so that that's this trajectory that we're on. And one thing I don't think we talked about is that the primary funding for wonders, there are other sources, but the primary funding comes from environment from Department of Energy, environmental system science specifically, and it's tied to our what's called our River Corridor Science Focus Area project. Um, this is a long-term project, and we continue to expand the spatial scale of this effort. And on that project, there are a lot of modelers um, that span a huge range of scales. Folks doing very mechanistic molecular modeling, like taking the organic matter chemistry, characterizing it in terms of thermodynamic properties, bringing in microbial uh, gene expression patterns, modeling that explicitly and mechanistically and connecting it to reactions, biogeochemical reactions, sediment respiration at laboratory scales and at reach scales and at whole stream network scales. And we're doing that at multiple watersheds across CONUS. In order to go towards this question that was asked of, of getting this knowledge, this information ultimately up into bigger system models. So that's a long answer, I guess, too. Short answers, yes. But there's a long answer. Yeah, very big picture. Great, thank you. We have a question from Rachel. She says, thanks for the great talk. Were there any surprises from the AI suggested priority sites? Uh, any suggestions that you guys were not considering? I think one surprise that came out was that um, kind of stabilization over time where it just kept wanting samples from the Eastern side, no matter how many uh, samples we had actually gotten. There was also the component though of real reality, which is, are there people there? Are there people willing to take samples there? So that was a constraint that we were working against with the model. I'm sure if anyone else wants to jump in. So that answer leads almost into the next question, which is, I really appreciate the application of iterative modeling and data to reduce spatial uncertainty with the final model uncertainty partly driven by places that are simply less populated. And can you speak a bit more about what error or uncertainty metrics were applied? Uh, I can try here. So sorry, my computer's having a real hard time. So, um, and I'm trying to reshare, but it's my computer's freaking out. Maybe someone else can share if we have if you have a moment. I could show slide 36 in particular. Um, that's the uncertainty the error map. Okay, so that map um, is based off of. Um, let me see. Oh, wait, did I just get this wrong? So actually we show, I don't know if we're going to see it or not. So Bree Waterman showed a slide that had a bunch of black dots all over it. Those are locations where we're making predictions. Um, and that's where with the, the dots are showing up in that GIF. Those are places where we're making predictions. And at every time we make a prediction, we get an uncertainty estimate out of the machine learning model, um, which has to do with um, uh, how basically how how biased that um, locations is expected to be relative to what reality should be. Um, and then 
And so that information, that uncertainty is a key element that's guiding us to where we should go next. So we're, we were targeting places with high uncertainty coming out of the machine learning model, um, as well as locations that were environmentally divergent from where we had already been in order to kind of really push things. And so um, at the end, when we get to the map of uncertainty, that map is basically um, interpolating uncertainty estimates from every one of those black dots. So most of those places, we don't actually have measurements. It's like over 2,000 locations um, across CONUS who are making predictions, and we have a, an uncertainty estimate out of the machine learning itself. Um, and the actual metric um, has to do with, uh, we're getting a, basically a standard deviation um, at each point, each of the black dots. I'm sorry, I'm not sharing the screen, but I like it's not working for me right now. Each black dot has a standard deviation um, based off this ensemble of ensembles that Bree Waterman was talking about. And we're basically calculating a coefficient of variation at that point. So um, in this case, what that should be is the standard deviation um, over the average rate at that point. So we tried to standardize it that way because we have this huge, like multiple orders of magnitude range in predicted rates. And so those maps of uncertainty are its co coefficient of variation, basically, um, is, the, uh, is the actual uncertainty that's being shown. That was rambly. Did that answer the question? Sorry, I didn't get so tight. Uh, I didn't get a tight answer. No, yeah, I think that was good. Thank you. Um, yep, and Dave, who asked the question, said, interesting, thanks. So I'm guessing you answered it some. Okay. We have uh, one more question in the Q&A right now from David. In one figure, you called out locations where time series were available. How did the time series measurements compare to the physical samples? Was there a lot of variability captured by the instrumentation that wasn't observed in the samples? So I can jump in there. When we say time series, we don't mean uh, we use a different sensor that was capturing data every 15 minutes. We mean that same site was revisited six times over the 18 months. So we have the samples that everyone else was capturing throughout time from these three sites. Um, and from my knowledge, we haven't actually delved into that data, so we don't know how much that differs from the um, other sample data that we have, but feel free for anyone else to jump in. And those three sites were NEON sites, right? Yeah, that's exciting. It'd be exciting to see that data. Yeah, just to build on that. So I think as we noted, that idea of doing multiple samples through time, that kind of time series came out of the one of those community calls. The Pope people on the call were like, oh my gosh, you need to have some kind of time series. That was upvoted in the poll everywhere. We're like, all right, Neon's going to be the place to do that. And we worked with y'all to figure out those sites to maximize environmental variability, think about like what's actually accessible all year round. Like that Northwest stream freezes over. They were out there like chipping away ice. The neon folks are out there chipping away ice. Thank you for those efforts. Um, but yeah, as as uh, Brienne mentioned, um, we haven't explicitly looked at time series from those. We threw everything into the machine learning models, and Brie Waterman made a nice map that she showed uh, of um, samples through time across seasons, and. Um, that one, yeah. So we have samples from all seasons across multiple years, and we threw all of it together. Um, and it's all of it seems pretty coherent. Um, there's only a few variables uh, that go in the machine learning that are temporally variable. There's a lot of geospatial temporally static variables, but there are things like water temperature, dissolved oxygen at the time of field sampling, pH at the time of field sampling. Um, there's only a few. We're hoping the molecular data will give us greater um, mechanistic resolution, but also those data types vary in time, like the organic matter chemistry, the microbes, that all is temporally variable. So when we bring that all in, I think we'll have a more explicit consideration of time from kind of the bottom up and the molecular details. 
So I want to thank you all for coming and giving us this great presentation. Um, as a reminder, the link to the video will be available on the Science Seminar webpage by the end of the week. Um, and then lastly, our next seminar will be on October 8th, when we'll be hearing about harnessing neon to enable the future of forest remote sensing. And we hope to see you then. Thanks.